Friday, and as you know, this is the time for our Friday Forums. My name is Cindy McDonald, and I am the host for the Friday Forums. It's an opportunity where you get to learn more about subjects that are important to you, whether they're in education or whether they're in business, just organization, or just life in general. And that's what we're going to talk about today is things that you can do in life to help you find that hidden genius. So welcome, Carrie. I'm glad to have you here. The Carrie Petzinger is my guest today, and she is a motivational speaker. She's a writer. She is many other things. So welcome, Carrie. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me here. So as everybody, as you're logging in, please put in your name and where you're from. And the thing I want to ask you about today is what did you do that was fun this week? So let us know and let Terry see where you're from and what you've been, um, what's been a fun thing that you've done this week. Uh, many of you know, I just literally came back from England. I was in the British Isles during the last 10 days. I got to be there during the time when um, the Queen passed away two days before I'd left. So we have been there during the whole morning time, followed King Charles around. He was in Cardiff when I was in Cardiff. And it was just a phenomenal experience to be there during this historic uh, event and just a historic time for the British people. Fortunately, I was not in London during the funeral. Um, I actually came into London that night, but I did not have to go downtown. So, so that was, I was very grateful for that. Oh my goodness, Kathy Salt and John. That's something that would be totally fun. So as you come in, put in your name and where you're from and what you did that was fun this week. And I want to shout out to Kathy too. Thank you. You were my host um, two weeks ago yeah, for you and Kazuay McGregor. That recording will be sent out shortly. I've got it almost ready and I'll be sending it out. So um, as people are joining us, Carrie, why don't you share a little bit about who you are and what your background is? That sounds good. So hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you today. So I am, my name is Carrie Petzinger and I'm in Minnesota. I'm in a really small town, just 2000 people here. I'm really close to Fargo, North Dakota. So usually when I meet people for the first time that are from other places, they're like, you sound like the movie Fargo. Uh, so I have a very, very strong Midwest accent. You could probably hear, but yeah, I'm in a small town in Minnesota. Um, my background is I have a doctorate in physical therapy and an have spent my entire year or career helping people achieve their goals. And it started out, you know, all being in the physical, physical realm of help, helping people recover from injuries and illnesses and those kind of things. But as time went on, I became super fascinated with peak performance and the, like the, the psychology of motivation and what makes people tick and what makes people um, super driven and what makes people happy and fulfilled and achieve different things. So I ended up uh, really studying the inner game of peak performance. And in 2015, started my own um, coaching and consulting company where I help people with a mental game. So I hope to help them uncover their potential and accomplish their biggest goals. So a lot of people that I work with have a big goal that they're working toward. They're either, you know, business owners that are working towards something, they're career pivoters, they're people who are looking at going to college and trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. And, and I really help them discover their strengths and gifts and then build, build a life um, that truly matters to them so that they can become who they were born to be. So that's kind of my background on that. And this, this generated, um, this interest that you had, Carrie, was generated through some experiences that you had yourself, yes. right? Yes, you are right. Yes. So my, um, you know, as far as the, the coaching company that I had started, I've always been fascinated by what motivates people. And I've always liked helping people reach their goals. Um, and then my own career journey 
I had some life experiences actually had, had trouble having kids. That's kind of what spurred my, um, restlessness in life. So uh, I, uh, I chose physical therapy. One of the things I liked about it was that I pictured it to have a great work-life balance. And I really liked the medical field. Um, and as time went on after my husband, and I got married, we had a lot of trouble having kids. So ended up having, um, years of miscarriages and infertility, um, issues. And at that point in life was just really very, very restless and, and very much like, what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to do with my career? It's turning out way different than I thought that it would. Um, and ended up on this journey of saying, well, you know what, I'm, I'm feeling stir crazy and restless in my life and in physical therapy. So maybe I'll go to medical school. So I actually, I took the, took the dental admissions test, took the MCAT, applied to DDS and MD and DO programs, um, got accepted and ended up requesting deferrals for a year and got deferrals for a year and said, I'm going to figure out in this year, what the heck that I want to do with myself and my life. Um, and ended up hiring, I hired five different people. I hired a couple life coaches. I hired a couple career coaches. And then I went to a college, um, career, like a college career counselor and mm -hmm. just to try to find what, what I was supposed to do with my life. Um, and ended up, you know, just training it like this deep self-discovery journey. And when I ended up figuring out the path that I wanted to go down, um, then I said, Kyle, you know what, once I, once I come out the other end, other side of this, I want to help people so that they don't ever have to feel like this. Cause when you look at the, the statistics of the amount of people that are feeling stuck or unfulfilled in their lives or not engaged at work, it's really, it's really high. There was a huge Gallup survey done a number of years ago of people in 142 countries and 87% of people aren't engaged at their jobs. Um, almost, wow. yes, almost seven out of 10 people feel trapped in their daily lives. And I said, God, I don't think life should be like this. So if we can start with people when they're younger so that they don't end up feeling, you know, stuck, stifled, restless, questioning the path that they're on, feeling like life is the daily grind, how much better would that be um, than people trying to deal with this in their thirties and forties and fifties. So that's kind of, kind of spurred my, sparked my passion to help other people who are going through something similar. And we see that as we work with students and many of us have gone through that uh, ourselves too. And this industry, we find a lot of people, this is their second or maybe even third career or beyond that. You know, they've done something and then because we have a lot of MDs, we have a lot of um, people who are former attorneys and, you know, from coming from diverse backgrounds, marketing, in addition to education and counseling and um, therapeutic backgrounds and things like that. So, you know, many, many of us have been down that path as well. And we see our students going down those paths. So you talk about finding your genius. What does that mean, Carrie? So the way that I describe it is it's really discovering like how you are wired at the core and what it is that you're born to do. So the analogy that I use is if you imagine a lion and a shark and they're both super strong, they're fast, they're powerful, they're muscular, they're sleek, they're awesome hunters, and they're the top of the food chain for where they live. But if you put a shark on land or you put a lion in the ocean, no matter how hard they work, no matter how hard they try to get along with the creatures around them, um, no matter how many you know motivational things they read, they're not going to perform at their best. They're not going to be fulfilled. They're not going to reach peak performance. They're just not going to be happy. They're not going to truly thrive as much as they could because they're not in the environment that they're designed to be in. So the way that I look at it is the more that a person, the more that every single one of us understands about ourselves and how we're wired and how we think and how we just operate innately, the more we understand that, the more that we can design our lives. So whether it's, whether it's career, whether it's personal life, whether it's how you communicate in your relationships, it affects everything. You know, the, the more you understand about yourself, um, you can design and set up your life and career in a way that lets you operate at your best. So I, I, I call it your genius zone. It's like finding this, this core of 
who you are on the inside, how you're wired, how you think um, with your values, what you want your life to be like, what truly lights you up. It's like all at the core of what makes, what makes you, you. So how do you find that out? I mean, so, you know, we, sometimes we think we know who we are and, you know, um, and we go down directions or we're, especially for our students, you know, they, they lean toward math or science or humanities or, you know, some other areas. And, and then they have to connect that. It's like, here's where my interests are. And this is what I need to study or what I, what I need to major in, or here's the job that I need to do for us as professionals. So so what, what have you found works to be able to uncover that? Yeah. So first I have a couple, a couple differences between when I help adults with this versus younger mm -hmm. people. Um, so I'll talk about mm -hmm. the adults part first. And then as far as students wise, so, so in general, it, I look at it as it's a combination of action and reflection. Okay. So if you, if you go back to, let's say you're the shark. And you're starting out going, God, I just, you know, I don't really know that I'm really happy in my life. I want to do something a little different here. Um, and you've realized you have fins and a tail and you think maybe I, I think I belong in water. And then you start heading toward water and you start out in the shallow river. And as you're there, you're going, gosh, I just know nope, something about the shallow river. I think I need, I belong in deeper water. And then you go to the deeper water and you're like, okay, this feels better. Um, but man, I think I need to be in salt water. It's, it's a combination of taking action and then reflecting on, okay, there's something not right about this, or this feels great. This is totally energizing. So it's overall, it's a combination of action reflection, but as far as being an adult, there's, there's three things that I like to consider first with people. And, and the first thing is, and this is a really, really hard thing for um, most adults. And this was very hard for me and myself included when I first started down this journey um, but the first thing is actually eliminating what I call false objectives. So false objectives are the things in life that you're, if you are 100% honest with the person in the mirror, they don't align with where you want to go and who you want to be. So there's those, th there's those things we're working toward in life that they really don't align with our true priorities. So an example of that is I have a cousin who, uh, you know, went, he went to college, got a traditional job, bought a big house. And a few years into his life like that, he was like, God, you know what? I just, all I want to do is travel the world. I want everything that I own to fit into a backpack. Um, and he ended up ever since then. So there's been like 25 years. He's been living like this. Now he works three to six month contracts for these big different companies in California. And then he leaves for three to six months and he rode on an elephant's head across Africa and he'll stay in people's, you know, places wherever. And he trap like, that's what he wants. His, what matters the most to him is a life of adventure and freedom and seeing different places in the world. Those are the things that he values the most. So for him, having a big house planted in one community is a false objective. All right. That's something that nope, doesn't align with him. If you compare that to someone who says, gosh, you know what? My biggest values in life are hospitality, community service, stability, routine. I want to be a pillar in my community and I want to host and entertain and really get to know people here. And then the big house that you can host a lot of people in that probably aligns with exactly what you want in life and definitely is not a false objective. And, but the, and neither, neither of those lifestyles are right or wrong. One's not better than the other, but right. You're not going to be happy if you're living something that really is a false objective. So the first thing is really, really paying attention to what are the things that you're achieving or, or the things you're currently doing in your life that if you have the courage to look in the mirror and say, gosh, this isn't, this isn't what I want. This isn't really aligned with my top priorities in life. Um, it can be really, really hard because we're ingrained from right when we're born. Like, here's the things that matter to you, whether it's your family or community or country you live in or anything, um, the people around us shape who we are, right? So the first thing is eliminating false objectives and having the courage to do that. The second thing is as an adult, um, it's really important just to sit down and, and map out what your core values are. Um, and because only you can decide what you want to focus your life on, 
where to set your boundaries, what things really um, deserve your full attention. So it's looking at that. And then the third thing is really a self-discovery journey. Um, there's some different self-assessments that I use and recommend to people and use it in my Discover Your Genius program. Um, but even if someone doesn't take some of those, it's really paying attention to what piques your interest, what turns your head, what comes naturally to you, what keeps you engaged and energized, um, what subjects really like make you excited um, and that you're, you know, you're passionate or you're interested and excited about. Sometimes people get a little um, like, oh, I don't know what my passion is because it seems like there's this pressure to find it. So if you just think of it as what are the things that, that keep my attention? What can I lose track of time when I'm doing it and start paying attention to all those types of things about you and discovering those things about you. And when you discover the things that energize and light you up, um, your strengths, your gifts, your talents, and match that up with your values, your priorities, you can be on, you know, well on the way to discovering who you are. Um, as far as students, when I'm helping students, so whether they're high school or college age, um, I don't go as much into the different, you know, the full subjectives, that kind of thing. Cause it's usually right. Yeah. It, it's, it's a different process, but that, that becomes more of a series of self-assessments. And then I go through and, and do this analysis of all the different assessments. I'm looking for themes. I'm looking for patterns. Um, and then having them go through different, some different reflection questions. And when I'm looking for patterns, what I'm doing is like, they don't come out of this, they don't come out of Discover Your Genius and, and say, you know what, I'm going to be a doctor because even within that, right? Like a, like a surgeon is like typically, okay, this is a very project oriented job. You see tangible results at the end of your day. You're potentially in high pressured situation. You're working very intimately with a team. Um, that typically that's a lot different than say you're in family medicine and you build a rapport with people over decades and decades. Right. And, and it, it's a different type of, um, personality or skill set or strengths that tend to do well within those. So what I, what I help the students see is their, their strengths and gifts and then, okay, so now within this and this, and these are some different things that interest you and light you up. Well, in what different industries could they use your strengths and gifts and how can you apply these to you know, solve a problem you'd like to apply that kind of thing. It's really, it's really a, a deeper dive into how they think and operate so that they can learn how to use that, whatever field they decide to go into. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. And it actually connects. So we, um, in August, we had Lisa Marker Robbins was one of my guests and, and she works students through a clarity process so that they can find clarity for future careers and majors. And, and I think that's the key thing is taking that pause, whether you're an adult or a student, and look at what are my values. And I loved how you said, you know, what energizes you, what lights you up, because there are certain, it's, you know, it's obvious, it, it becomes very, um, um, you know, clarifying again to, to be able to look at those things like, yeah, this lights me up. I know with students, especially, and, and also us as adults, there might be multiple things. You know, they're, they're probably, you know, they're, they're drawn to lots of things in lots of different directions. So how do you take somebody who has all these interests in lots of different areas and help them to create a more focused or narrow, um, direction that they're going so I like to look at if they're going oh you know I like this or I like this or I like this I like to look at well how how can you combine the way that you think and you know these different is there a way that you can combine combine these different interests that you have and make them all you know mold into a into a path for you um also, I like to look if there if there's different things that light them up. I look like to look at the commonalities of what are they lit up when they're doing. Like, are all of the things that they light them up involve they're working with a big group of people and they're very social and they're leading things, 
or is all of these things are this almost like an engineering mind where they can sit and like tinker with things or figure out, they love to figure out how things work. So they're fascinated with those types of things. Like I, I like to look at what are the common denominators of really what they're doing. And if, and if people, um, you know, say, say adult, say an adult is, is kind of stuck and they're like, gosh, I, I just don't know. I don't know what lights me up. I don't know. I'm just kind of feeling this burned out or stuck in my career. Um, if I, I kind of think of it, like if, if you haven't figured out what you're passionate about in your current daily routine, you're not going to find it by continuing to do that current daily routine. You actually have to switch things up. And uh -huh. sometimes that thing can be just something little, right? So I actually think about a friend of mine who was a, she was an, a physical therapist and she still is. She ended up, she owns her own private practice now, but years ago, she was kind of feeling a little, um, a little stir crazy. And she was, she started like going to learn about things that she thought were interesting through these community ed classes, right? Ended up going to um, like a glass blowing class one Saturday and thought it was the amazing thing ever, most amazing thing ever, started taking more classes on it, now has this awesome studio where she sells this glassworks all over. And it just gave her this creative side of her that she didn't know she had. Um, but I, I like to think of it like, gosh, if, if we're stuck or, or stifled or frustrated and we're like, I don't know what lights me up, you got to switch it up and do something a little bit mm -hmm. different. I, um, when I, One of the things that I had done when I was feeling restless in my career is I said, you know what? I'm going to leave my job and I'm going to take a travel PT job, 2000 miles from home and just figure out like what I want to do. So I took a short-term contract, 2000 miles up from home and just doing that, it was a different setting. I had come from a, an outpatient clinic where we were in the basement, um, without an, you know, without any windows and that schedule was very regimented, went to a different setting in a skilled nursing facility in Florida with huge windows. I could take all my patients outside during the day. I could walk in the door every day and set my own schedule and have the freedom to see them in the order I wanted to. And just that in and of itself was like, oh, I love being able to set my own schedule. I love being able to be outside. I love having a huge team. I walk through this building. There's hundreds of people I can say hi to every day instead of being feeling trapped in a little office in the basement corner. Like, so there's different things you find out about yourself and what I didn't know what was making me feel stuck before, but when you, sometimes when you switch things up, you start realizing, oh, this really lights me up. Or this is, this kind of made me feel a little stir crazy before. So we, it's again, that combination of like action and reflection and having the courage to switch some things up in your life or your work, um, to start finding, finding that what truly makes you excited and en engaged and energized. I, th I think that a very good point and something that we often don't consider and so having that pointed out and making that more obvious and setting it as a goal and that's where having a coach like you is helpful I know you know you and I've had a coaching relationship and you know just having you point out things can be very invigorating and motivating as well um, so one other thing that that I see a lot in and because in this industry, people are coming at it, a lot of them are going through this process of, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something else. I volunteered. I've helped students. I love working with students. I see this in my classes that I teach for UCLA as well. But it also entailed becoming an entrepreneur, being your, you know, starting your own business. And for many people, that is not a comfortable thing. It is not their um, top choice. So they have to combine something they may not be comfortable with in order to do the thing that really energizes them. So have you found ways to help people manage those two? It, it almost is like this conflicting, I want to do this, but I've got to do this in order to, to make that happen. I would say that, I have them look at their ideal life that they want to live. And, and that's kind of an ongoing process, especially when you're, when you're younger and there's still a lot of things you don't, you don't really know. Like, I don't know what my, you know, when you're 18, you don't know what your ideal schedule is. you would never had one. Right. You know? So, so part mm -hmm. of it is it kind of, they brainstorm and then act and reflect and act and reflect. Um, but I really look at ideally what kind of lifestyle do you want? What is your ideal day? 
Um, you know, I mapped before I ended up in, in about 2014, I really mapped out like, here's my ideal day. Here's what I want in my ideal week. Here's the times I'm doing blank. Here's how often I'm with other people. Here's how often I'm working on a certain project by myself, like really mapping that out and then saying, okay, so there's the ideal life that I want to have and what type of work that aligns with my strengths can I put in that, in that ideal day? So it, if that makes sense, so it's actually like a lot of times we'll look at what path do I want to go down for my work and then try to cram our lives around the edge of that career. But I actually look and say, what do you want your life to look like? Okay. Now here's what we need. Here's how you can use your strengths and gifts and talents and put a career into that life. And sometimes, you know, like you mentioned, if there's something like, well, to get there, it's the entrepreneurial path or to get here, you got to do this. Sometimes in order to get, I would say almost always in order to get to the life that we ideally want to live. Terry, you just froze. Oh, did you I? Went, yeah. Uh, is I, it better now? End, I can hear you. Um, okay. It says my internet connection is unstable. Um, so go back to what you just said. So when you get to that point and you're looking at trying to fit your ideal life and fit your career in there, go back to that point. Okay. So, so I look at it as deciding the kind of life that you want. And then as you learn about your strengths, your gifts and talents saying, okay, well, what can I do that, that fits into the life that I want to have? And knowing that almost always to, to build our best lives, to build our ideal lives, to be the best versions of ourselves, to reach our peak performance, it almost always requires us to do a lot of things outside of our comfort zone, right? So it, it's like, if, if the end goal is, man, I've got this, I've got this big dream and it's going to require me to do blank and blank, but it's really my big dream. And it's aligns with the life that I want and who I want to be and my values, my priorities. And I really think it's the difference in the world I want to make, but oh, I don't want to do that thing to get there. Then it's like, okay, then you got to learn how to, to learn the mental game to get you there. Right. Mm -hmm, or if right. it's like, Hey, I think it'd be cool to do blank because someone so said it'd be neat or the job market could be good for this. Or this kind of seems interesting but in reality, doesn't really align with my values, doesn't really align with my strengths and gifts, doesn't really align with my ideal life, then it's like, okay, then, then you got to figure out what does. That's kind of the way that I, I look at, I look at that. And, and whenever we have a big goal, I look at it like the beginning, you know, if I, if I say I want to run a marathon, that beginning part is so exciting and I'm engaged and inspired and motivated. And I sign up and tell my friends, I'm going to do it. And then you've got the last hundred meters of the race and no one ever, no one ever comes to the last hundred meters and says, gosh, I guess this just isn't working. I'm going to worth it. I'm just going to quit. Right. Mm -hmm. You see the end and you finish it, but it's that 90% that I call the messy middle. And that's whether or not you're a plot, whether or not you're writing your gazillionth essay for college applications or you you're it's two years in and it's way harder program than you anticipated or you're starting your career and it's tougher than you thought it's like gosh you're in that messy middle and if you want what's at the end and it aligns with who you want to be and where you want to go it's truly figuring out all the mental that mental game that inner game so that you can have the have the grit and the skill set and the perseverance to get to where you want to go or to be honest with yourself and say gosh you know what I'm two years into this and I've decided this doesn't align with who I want to be and where I want to go. And I'm going to have the courage to say, okay, I, I need to do something different because that's a diff very different action plan. Right. 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 Well, and you bring up another really good point that applies to our industry in particular. Um, it has ebbs and flows, you know, during the spring and the uh, winter, after December, you know, things are a little more, um, calm. Let me put it that way. Right now, we're all in the throes of helping students with their applications. And I know trying to create a work-life balance during this time can be quite a challenge. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm trying to promote and, and help, um, you know, my colleagues to be able to understand and, 
um, evaluate as well, what can you do to help, you know, maybe you are still working 12 or 14 hour days, but, you know, what are some self care things that you can do during that time to still maintain a level of work life balance. So are there things that you have found that are beneficial, especially in a high pressure situation like that? Yes. So first of all, I like to look at when it comes to work-life balance is have people really identify what that means to them um, because it can look so different. You know, the, the way that I run my work hours is different than a, a normal kind of nine to five work week because there's, I love working a super long Monday. You know, I'm super recharged and relaxed and refreshed from the weekend and I love it. So that's kind of what I very intentionally do. And then there's other days of the week that are very intentionally shorter. I'm working at this different location or there, there's things that are super set up when it comes to that. So, so looking at number one, what is that? What, what is your ideal work-life balance, especially when you are in those times that it's like, okay, this is, this is crazy busy. Um, and, and there's times too, that when things, because of your industry, when it's like, gosh, you know, just like accountants, when there's tax season, right? Right. It's like, right. Okay. Here we are in the busy. Um, it's going at that with in not necessarily always seeking balance at that time, but seeking an intentional imbalance and saying, what do I want the focus to be right now? What are the things that I can truly prioritize, um, you know, right now in these upcoming weeks? Um, another thing that I look at is setting super crystal clear boundaries. And mm -hmm. I don't think that there's any way to, um, at, at least, at least for me that I, I haven't found that there's any way to have what I truly want in life, which is to be a very present parent and have the social life and all mm -hmm. those other things right, that right. I want with the work, um, without have, without setting super, super crystal clear crystal clear boundaries and deciding intentionally where you want those to be, um, too. And then I always, well, and then, and Cindy knows this, but I have this morning, morning mindset routine that I always love to do. And it helps me feel like just a sense of balance and focus. And like, I can conquer what's in, in my day. So, so having your day set up where you have a very super crystal clear, um, intentional start to the day can, can really help too. One other, this is just kind of a little side thought about this. Um, I was listening recently to a psychologist, Adam Grant. He was talking about, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he was talking about well-being yeah. in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that researchers, you know, when the pandemic was going on, researchers were studying like what made people feel a really good, strong sense of well-being when they were going through tough times. And he said, surprisingly, it wasn't optimism. It was flow. So he talks about going into flow state where it's something that, that you do, where you are very intentionally saying, I'm going to do blank this one task, single task, one task for 90 to 120 minutes. I'm going to set a timer. I'm going to turn off all potential distractions and inter interruptions, and I'm going to take action on this one thing. And, and he said that the people who gave themselves the permission to go into flow state every day came out of the pandemic with way higher amounts of well-being. And I, I look at that as being something that can massively help us during those busy times of business um, where it's like, okay, all distractions and interruptions, like my notifications on the phone, computer, everything are off. And it's really single tasking, really focusing on one thing at a time. And, and if you look at um, the average person touches, taps, or swipes their cell phone it's, I think it's 2,700 times a day. It's either 2,100 wow. or 2,700 times a day. Um, and when we get interrupted or distracted, so if you're, if you're working on your computer and your phone dings and you look at it, it takes us on average 23 minutes to get our focus back to the level it was at before we got temporarily interrupted. Distracted. Yes. So it, it's like those little things. And we always think, well, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to check this, this text quick. But it, in reality, it drains your energy. It causes us to make more errors. It makes you tired. Um, all of that, that switch tasking back and forth. So when you can look at really saying, here's the one thing I'm going to do right now and, and work on being so focused. So like, okay, now, now I'm working, I'm in flow state. My interruptions and distractions are minimized to the best of my ability. 
and now I'm done with my work day and I'm home and I'm present and I'm focused, like being very mindful and present, you know, and then if there are things that you can delegate or eliminate from your calendar too, and look and say, what, what, am, what is the work that I do that truly aligns with my genius zone? Like what are, what are the things that light me up that use my strengths and gifts? And what are the things that real in reality, they don't require me. I could potentially have a system right. and automation, a person doing this thing for me to make it so that you're more focused on the things that energize you. Cause then work-life balance feels so much better. Right. 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 You can do right. something that you don't like for two hours and it feels like the longest two hours of life, or you can do something <laughs> you absolutely love. And 16 hours later, you forcing yourself to go home because you need to stop because it's been so much fun and you love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, those are very good points. And, and that's one of the other things that I think the delegation or outsourcing is another big thing that I like to talk about because how many of us like doing the bookkeeping or, you know, billing? And that's the part that we just, take, that is most um, unnatural or uncomfortable for us that we dislike the most, but it's, I mean, it's a crucial part of it because that's how we get paid. Mm-hmm. Having someone else, having a system, you know, there are a lot of ways that you can either delegate or outsource things so that you can focus on the things that are going to help you build and grow. So Lauren has had a couple of questions here um, that I see, yes. and I think I can them very read thoughtful them off things. One, Go ahead, Carmen. One very relevant to what you guys just mentioned. Um, I can set boundaries, but I struggle to follow them um, this time of year. Thoughts on that? I do. So I would say it really starts by like one tiny little boundary at a time. It really does because set, setting and holding your boundaries, it's a skill set that you practice over and over and over. And, and it's showing up for yourself and treating those boundaries as sacred and as so, so important. So treating yourself like you're super important, that your boundaries are super important, but I would practice just one super crystal clear small boundary at a time. Um, the more I had someone the other day who wants to leave, they want to eventually leave their full-time job and become a full-time writer. And we were talking about boundaries and they're having some trouble, you know, finding time to write right now. And I said, well, here's the thing. If you don't allow yourself to write for 10 minutes a day, you're not going to allow yourself to write for 25 hours a week. Right. So it's, it's truly, it's saying, okay, here's my boundary around blank. And I'm going to show up and I'm going to do the thing that I said I was going to do and, and setting boundaries are so super. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. I was, I was just reading your thing in the chat here. <laughs> yeah. I just posted um, a question. Yeah, so. That's good. That's a good question. Um, there. Yeah. And I, I would love to hear the answer too. Cause then I can give some more specific advice. If there are, if there are same with you, Lauren, like if there's something specific that you want to set a boundary around, um, I can give you some more kind of, kind of specifics there, but it truly starts with saying, okay, here's the one, this is the one boundary that I want to have. Um, a lot of times I'll recommend people start with setting boundaries around mindless consumption, which is typically social media. If we look at the research, um, the average person right now spends nine years of their life mindlessly scrolling social media. So if we look at, okay, how can I be very intentional if I'm using social media? Um, and not that social media is bad, but it's like when you set a boundary and say, I'm going to be intentional and go on here for the purpose of perusing or connecting or whatever, when it's intentional, it's different than time sucking, mindless consumption. Um, another thing with boundaries too, that I like to do is if there's like a habit you want to start or a boundary that you want to set, I look at habit stacking. So I look at, okay, so say someone says, you know what, I want to start a 10 minute, you know, meditation routine in the morning. I would say, okay, stack it against something that you're already doing. So you remember to do it. So it's like, you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you take a shower, then you meditate. You get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you take a shower, then you meditate. When you can stack that habit, against another thing you're already doing that you already just, it's so ingrained, you just do it as part of your every single day. It's gonna make it more easy for you to start implementing that habit and then holding that boundary there. All right, all right, can I read what Lauren said here? I tell students sure. I need to at least, me at least five days before a deadline, but they text me two hours before it's due, I feel pressured to help. 
Okay. Yeah. And, and that's, that is, that's very super tricky. Um, it, that is, that can be very tricky because it is, you're, you're in that, that industry where you definitely want to help them. But I would also look at um, if they, so, so number one, and I don't know as far as your industry, cause every industry is different. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe it's totally normal for them to text you. Like, I know that as far as like all of my coaching clients, I I was just telling someone this the other day, I don't let, I don't let them text me. Um, that's just a boundary that I've set. And it's not that I don't, it's not that I mind texting, but I'm super crystal clear about like, here's how they communicate with me so that I can shut it off because otherwise I would do the same thing. If I said, Hey, get me blank before your coaching session on you know, get, get me blank by four 30 on Monday. So I can look at it by our coaching session on Tuesday. If they would text me at nine 30 PM on Monday, I would ha- I would feel like I had to look it over. Right. So it, one, one of the things I have, a I actually have a Google voice number that I call coaching people from, but if I do happen to call them from my phone, if they text me a couple days later with a question, I'll email them and I'll say, Hey, I saw your question. I'm, I'm emailing the answer to you so I can keep all of your stuff in one file. Like I'm keeping it all here. And that's kind of how I set that boundary. Like I don't ever respond to the text. Um, and then I just kind of set that precedent of like, this is how, so, so one thing. And then I also have an automated email reminder that goes out. So if people email my business email address, it goes back like, Hey, thank you so much for this. Um, I respond within 48 business hours, but not on um, you know, weekends or holidays and it just goes out and, and usually I'll respond quicker than 48 hours, but it's just, then I know they got it. I know that if I see an email come in, I don't have, feel the pressure right now to read it. Um, so that's a couple of ways that I've found that, that I've been able to hold what I feel are good boundaries yet also feel like I'm providing good service. Um, does that make sense, Lauren? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, and I it. think, There's a lot, hold on just a second, Carmen. So I think this is something we all run into, especially at this time of year. And the other thing to keep in mind is we're working with teenagers and they are always on crisis intervention mode, right? Whatever is due next week or tomorrow is what they're working on. And so they, it's, it's easy for them to miss these kinds of deadlines for whatever reason. So I would think it would be helpful if people have other suggestions, things that they've done. Texting is a big thing. I know people who allow students to text, I do, but a lot of people don't. Um, it really depends on your, you know, your boundaries, your how you like to work and those kinds of things. I don't feel compelled to answer a text if it comes in at nine o'clock. I just, it doesn't bother me. So, so that works for me, but not everybody would that be acceptable. Um, and so it's helpful go ahead. To, to hear what other people have done. Um, Cause it is, it's hard We're we are working with teenagers. We are going to set deadlines for them and we know some of them are going to meet them and some are not. So um, that, that gives us a way to think about how do we manage that? And maybe you charge more if they're, you know, and if the parents know that they're going to end up spending more, maybe they will help enforce the student getting it there sooner. You know, there's just a lot of different things. So, okay, yes. Carmen. Well, and I was gonna say, so okay. Kathy says too, is that's, that sounds easy, but in deadline driven industry, I'm not certain that's the best course of action. Their kids, they won't always comply. And I get that. Mm-hmm. I work with a lot of kids too, with coaching, but I, my response to that is a couple of things. So number one, I like how Cindy had, had said, Hey, you could have it where it's like, Nope, you're going to charge more if you have this or this correspondence. Um, but also, also to look at it and say, how do you want to run your business and you set your business up with, with the boundaries and, or the deadlines, the communication expect expectations, you set your business up the way that you desire to run it. Um, because, and know that however you choose to respond. So if you say, Hey, you have to have this to me by 5 PM and it's 11 at night and they get something to you and you're responding and dealing with it, then set your business up so that if you are going outside of your boundaries that you create, that you're not doing it so that you're going to be resentful or burn out. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's truly, it's saying, 
what is the business that I want to run? How do I want to do this? And how can, how can you give absolutely amazing customer service and honor your boundaries? Um, there was a book that I was reading on boundaries um, recently, and it was, it's about, I can't remember the guy's name and what company, but he's the CEO of one of the biggest companies in America. And he was talking about his boundaries and how he's been able to have an awesome work-life balance, even being super, super busy CEO. And he said, the way that he does it is every single day of the week, like this is the focus. And if he's going to go out in the community and give a talk, it's on a Tuesday. If you're going to come into his office and meet with him, it's on a Thursday. Like there's no, there, there's no, like that's how it is. And every, everyone around him doesn't think he's a jerk. They just know, oh, I want to talk with him about something. Okay. I'm going to check the schedule for Thursday because that's when, that's when I can do that. And the, when he sets, he, he has set up that up and very much crystal clearly communicated that with all of the people that he works with, all of his clients, everybody, and they just know, okay, this is what to expect. You set your, when you set your boundaries, you train the other people this is what they need to do to fit into that work with you. And again, it, it's, it's, a, it's an art and a science to set awesome boundaries and do it in a way where you're providing really good customer service. It's not an, it's not an overnight thing. Well, and that's the key. And, and I think that's one of the things that we need to realize as um, entrepreneurs and as business owners is that it's ever evolving. And you try something, it works great. And if it doesn't, then you try something else and see how that works. And, and that's where our community is such a valuable resource because then you ask other people, well, what are you doing? How's it working for you? What is, you know, what are you finding that, um, that are giving you the kind of support or information or tools or whatever? So, and that's one of my roles too, is to help explore those by having guests like yourself and other ways to, to look at things and, and explore those. So, so that's really, really great. Um, okay, nice. looks like we have a couple of more questions. Oh, are a couple yeah. more questions. Go um, ahead. How, how have you learned about all the career fields to best help students find where their gifts, talents, um, oh, et cetera, are Oh, sorry, I didn't hear the, didn't the beginning part. I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, how have you learned about all the career fields to help, to best help students find where their gifts, talents, et cetera, will fit? Um, I find it super hard to know everything that's out there because jobs are always changing. So as far as that goes, um, I don't try to learn about every single possible field that is out there because like you said, the jobs are always changing. And I know, I can't remember what I'd read recently about how they, I can't remember what percent, like it was like by 2040, like blank percent of new job. I mean, it was just something crazy of like the percentage of jobs they picture haven't even yet been invented that the, the amount of yeah. kids yeah. now will be in. So yeah. I don't even try to learn all of the different things that are out there. I try to help students discover if they're the lion or the shark or like all the things about them so that no matter what happens in different industries, they can put themselves in the environment that is going to help them optimize who they are. So I take it more of a, okay, here's your strengths and gifts and, and how you think and how you operate. And, and then, they, and then I have them do some too, like look at, looking into some different options and the things that interest them, but I don't try to learn all of the things just because they are always changing. Mm -hmm. And, and I could, I could tell someone, you know, go be a lawyer and they realize there's tons and tons of different possibilities and even the office sizes and how often they work with people might align not at all with their strengths. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and oh, sorry. I, I was going to say the, the boundaries thing, Cindy. So going back to that boundaries question we were talking about a minute ago too. Um, one thing with adults that I've really found too, is when I help them discover their genius sometimes too, it's like what comes out in their strengths and gifts assessments will be very high on, um, empathy, compassion, being there for other people, relationship building. And then it's looking at like, that's awesome. Those things all very much likely help you provide awesome customer service and be this amazing quick rapport with people. Now, how can you set really awesome boundaries? and still feel like you're compassionate and helpful and that kind of thing too. So, so sometimes people's own strengths, well, 
every time people's own strengths yeah. and you ha- have these certain things where it's like, okay, because you think and operate like this, here's how you need to set up your life to maximize this and make sure that you are super fulfilled and not burned out and running the business mm-hmm. and what you want. Right. I, I, right. I can talk about this stuff forever. So hopefully. Not. <laughs> well, that's good. That's <laughs> All right. Carmen, what's the next question? We've got I noticed I that a students um, lose their interest, especially after pandemic. They don't know what they want. What can be the first easy and simple step to tab and um, brainstorm like an interest or motivation to discover their interest again? So one of the things is, well, there's a couple different things. Um, one of the things I like to have people do if, if they start by feeling like I have no clue what I want more than likely they can look at their life and identify some things that are in it that they know that they don't want. So I like to have people start decreasing the time spent on the things that they know that they don't want. Um, I also like to have them start moving out of consumption mode and into um, like creative engagement mode where they're doing something, right? They're, they're creating, they're doing, they're doing something. They're out either like serving or helping or creating or building like they're instead of consuming or reading or learning they're doing they're engaging with the world um I like to have them do things like that and another thing and and it just in general for people in life um now I, I wouldn't a student would probably roll their eyes or get mad at this comment but in general if someone feels like I'm not I don't know what I want I'm totally disinterested one of the best things a person can do, you know, kid or adult is just start moving. You know, it's like Mm -hmm. when, when you look at, gosh, if we can, if we can move our bodies, um, and this comes from my PT background too, but, but just, um, the amount of confidence, self-esteem, interest, engagement, energy, happiness, all of those things, just, it's something that if people are like, man, I'm not passionate, I've lost I've lost my spark and I'm just pandemic out. It's like, if you can get yourself engaged where you're the creating and you're not consuming um, or you are moving more, that can help help people just kind of spark their interest and, in, you know, joy. Mm-hmm. Well, and especially as she mentioned, you know, with the pandemic, you know, that people suffered quite a bit in many different ways, especially our students. So I think that's really mm-hmm. great advice you know, to, to look at. So, well, and also and, too, is to, is to look at, you know, if you can ask yourself, and this is something that I have people do in my 10 minute mornings that matter mindset routine um, is one of the things that I have them do every single morning is a purpose driven action where you wake up in the morning and you say, what can I do to add value, meaning, or connection? this morning. And so you're actually, you know, out of your own head and you're engaging with the world, you're, you're doing something, um, that Mm -hmm. adds value, meaning or connection. So it's like that purposeful, intentional action again, versus mindless consumption Mm -hmm. and reaction. And I think that's the key, you know, so, so much in our lives. And I know I, I still struggle with this is everything we're doing is a reaction, answering an email, you know, doing these different things rather than getting into that creative um, flow that you talked about and, and making things happen that we want in the future by dedicating the time to it now, because you're always reacting things, you're not creating things. So, so that's, that can be a struggle. So John brings up a really good question. And then it touches on one of the next questions that I wanted to ask. We've got got uh, about five minutes left. So Carmen, do you want to go ahead and go through that? Yes. So um, I have adult ADHD and have a tendency to experience anxiety and overwhelm when the demands of my startup college prep is increased. Do you have any tips to be able to increase my capacity to press through and overwhelm? And okay. then second to that would be, do you have an online program that is available for ICs to help high school students find their genius? All right. Yes. So as far as the adult ADHD um, and overwhelm, I heard something recently the other day from, there was a psychologist that was talking about overwhelm and they said their, their opinion, this is just their own opinion, but their opinion of overwhelm is that we experience overwhelm either when we are underprepared or under committed. 
Um, so if we haven't fully committed or we haven't fully prepared. So one of the things that I, I look at with overwhelm, um, I think it was a Henry Ford quote when he, I think he had said like, nothing is particularly difficult if we separate it into small enough, like mm -hmm. small enough tasks, right? So I, I look at overwhelm and say, okay, how can I very intentionally have my calendar set up and that it's very much single tasking. It's very much present. Everything that I'm going to do is written out. So, so with that, um, I actually sit down. So every single Monday morning, I sit down and map out the week and map it out in half an hour chunks so that by the time Monday lunchtime hits, the week is, is seriously mapped out. I have some flex hours built in where if I have a sick kid or if I need to go to the dentist or something, there, there is some flex time, but overall it's very much like, here's the priorities for the week. This is their time slots. And when that time slot comes like, Nope, I'm very super. Here's the timer that is set. Here's all the distractions that are off to the best that I can. And this is the, the single focused thing. Um, and also looking at the things, if you do feel that there's certain things that are making you feel overwhelmed, I would look at um, what, you know, if there's certain tasks that it's just like, gosh, these tasks make me feel like I'm just swimming upstream. They just don't align with my strengths and gifts. Like I just got to get rid of these, you know, then it's looking at how can you do them more efficiently? How can you have a process or a system or a person? Um, so that you can spend time doing the things that, that feel better to you. So sometimes it's really looking at, at, you know, optimizing the way that you're doing your work. Um, but also, yeah, being very present, very focused. I always say, if you can't, you know, people have these really giant to-do lists and I used to run my life like that too. But if we, if it doesn't fit on a paper calendar, it'll never fit in our real life actual calendar. So it's like, when you take right. it and think about, I want to do this and this, this week, put it and map it out. So it has a time, it has a day, it has a place. And the more that you do that out in the future, the more that you deal with less um, emergencies or this, this, and this happened, or this derailed my day, or this popped up for me because it's so intentionally mapped out in advance that it doesn't feel as overwhelming. So there's a few different things um, okay. as far as. As far as that second question, John, do I have an online program that's available? I do. So I have a, a program called Discover Your Genius, and it is for um, students, and it also works great for adults. Um, it works great for adults who want to pivot their careers and also adults who are in a career path or own a business that they want to learn to be more effective. So like yesterday, yesterday morning, um, one of the clients that I have in it right now, she's a veterinarian. She runs a very successful vet clinic, um, and she is happy as a vet, but really wants to optimize her day. She's struggling with work-life balance. She wants to know how she can run her team and lead it better um, and just be more effective overall. So she's in it. And it's again, this, this deep dive self-discovery. It's a six week journey um, and that she's learning about herself and how she can best optimize. Here's how to set up your day. Here's how, what to do when, um, here's where to set your boundaries. Here's how you can be the most highly productive and fulfilled. Um, and here's how you can lead and communicate with your team with the strengths and gifts that you have. So yes, with students too, it's the same, it's the same concept and, and they go through a series of self-assessments. I analyze them all. I'm looking for themes and patterns of how they think, how they innately operate, and then having them go through a series of reflection exercises and we do some one-on-one -on -one coaching um, and it helps them. So yes, I do. And, and I can send, um, I can give Cindy the, the link for that. And I also have a discount code too, where if, if any of you say, yep, that's something that I would like to take for my own self to, to learn how to run my business and life and optimize it for peak performance. Um, I have a discount code for that. And I also have, um, yeah, a code that I can get to Cindy as far as if, if you feel like, yep, that's something I would love my students to, to go through. I can give you a code for that too. That would be great. <clears throat> and you have a book that you're writing, right? I do. And it's going to be available sometime in November. Yes. Yep. It is. It's going to be, um, in November. So that, um, it's called mornings that matter and it's a, a 10 minute, it's a research-based 10 minute morning mindset routine to start each day feeling unstoppable. So it's a, it's a mindset routine. I taught to people from over 70 countries and I speak on this, um, to different organizations and schools teach. 
um, teachers and students how to start each day feeling unstoppable. It's been proven to decrease burnout and help people reach their goals. So yeah, I'm excited. I'm, o- I'm almost done. I'm editing the last chapter right now and the cover is all done. Everything's done. They just need me to finish up a couple things. Oh, that's exciting. That's very exciting. So, well, Carrie, thank you very much. And and as she mentioned, we'll have the coupon code links. You've got her email address in the chat and um, just let her know that you heard her on Cindy's Friday Forum and she'll know where it comes from. And Carrie, thank you so much. This is just a very um, ongoing, it's a conversation we could have continued another, you know, all day basically. So I'm glad everybody was here. Um, Everybody join us next week. We're going to have Jeff Levy and Jenny Kent, who many of you know and love. They're going to come and talk about their data and they just released it in August. So we're going to have a conversation about that. And if you haven't looked at their website, if you go to bigjconsulting.com, there's a resources page and that's where they post their data. So we're going to, um, they're going to talk about what their process is. And so come with questions, come to learn and come to enjoy. And, uh, and just thank you for everyone being here today. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, thank Carmen. You. And thanks to everyone to, to join us. So we'll see you again next week. And then I've got a couple of great sessions in October. If you have some ideas or people you want me to talk to, please send them to me because I'm, I'm starting to book out into the next year. So 2023. So, all right. Everybody have a great weekend. Carrie, have a wonderful weekend. Thank Carmen, you. you too. Everyone stay safe and do something fun. Do something self-care for yourself, um, especially during this time. We all need it. So. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye.